appointed office. The question is why should we care? What are the implications and why is it important that we get women into elective and appointed office more than ever in Nigeria? Okay, so uh, again, thank you all for having me on this. And I hope that some of my experience having worked in Nigeria and also here in the United States, um, I'm now currently working on Capitol Hill, um, will just help shed some light to some of the the reasons why I think it's very important for women's political participation and what that should what that can look like. I think first and foremost, we need to understand that women's rights are human rights. Um, when we don't acknowledge this, then we're basically saying that women aren't human beings. And so when we talk about um, what we should have as human rights, we should make sure that conversation includes us. Don't forget that. Um, and you know, for years, women have been playing roles with no recognition. We have been on the front lines of conflict resolutions in our communities. We've been the backbone of political parties. We galvanize the community, we organize, we raise money for other people, uh, well, basically men, um, and we're getting, and now you have more and more women going to school for um, you know, political science, law, studying national security, technology, all of these things that are going to be influential in moving a country forward. So we shouldn't continue to sit on the sidelines. Um, and I think Another thing to keep in mind is that studies have shown, so I'm not just saying this from, you know, in, in my brain, but studies have shown that when women are equal and active participants in political and political participation, countries are more pr prosperous, peace is more sustainable, and governance is more inclusive. Um, I think one of the one thing I learned in my last role when I was working at the National Democratic Institute, uh, because I worked on some of their gender and women's programs, and that is just about especially in the conflict resolution areas, you know, the narrative oftentimes from the West is the place of women being vulnerable. And that's not to say that women aren't vulnerable and we aren't um, in the position and we aren't being attacked and whatnot. But women have been playing crucial roles in the communities and getting people to stop fighting and getting, you know, um, you know, uh, terrorist groups out of the community. It's women leaders that get people together. And so I think that that aspect is often neglected. And when it's neglected, we are not thinking about ways to continue to support women who are at the front lines. And, and this could be our mothers, our grandmothers. I mean, if we talk to them, you'll know that they've all played some role in politics. I mean, Winnie basically ran Mandela's government. And even to her death, people really talk about her and not necessarily always, you know, Mandela. It was about Winnie and what Winnie did. And so I think that is very important that, you know, these are reasons why we should care about women's political participation and understand that it can look like, it can look, it can take shape or form in different ways. Um, some other really interesting data that's out there is that, you know, while less than 15% of nations are led by women, the top four spots in last year's Forbes list of most powerful women were, went to all political leaders. And so, like I said, data shows that women are great politicians. Women are great at leading political, you know, um, whether institutions um, are, are raising funds. We do the work, but we're only 15% of nations are led by women, including the United States. And so if countries continue at this current pace, it will take another 95 years to achieve the goals of, go of gender parity. So we are not really moving fast. Um, I think even in the United States, um, you know, this year marks 100 years of the women's suffrage movement. And I mean, as great as that movement was, it still was, it still eliminated um, a group of women, which is black women who didn't have the right to vote. But in addition to supporting you know, uh, white women, black women were also still fighting for themselves. So they were playing a dual role. So I know it is in our DNA to be able to, you know, fight, organize, and, you know, get together. Um, and so, you know, we just need to ask ourselves, you know, what's next? What do we want to achieve? Um, you know, in America, um, over time, we have seen women leaders such as Shirley Chisholm. She was the first black woman in Congress. Uh, we've also seen women run for president, Jill Stein, Hillary Clinton, and even most recently in the Democratic primary elections have shown that America just doesn't have the appetite for female leadership at the highest power. Now, this current Congress, um, has the largest uh, number of women. I believe the number is 89, but that's 89 of like 300 and something seats, if not more, uh, between the House and the Senate. 
that's so we have two chambers we have a lower chamber and a high and an upper chamber similar to to nigeria and i think i want to believe there are 500 and something seats but there are only a small amount i'm sorry the democratic party has 89 women and of those women 25 are black and that's what you would consider to be the largest number so as you can see we still have a long way to go i try not to use america as the as the big benchmark when I think of women's political participation, I actually see more African countries, uh, you know, leading the charge. And I believe that Africa is ripe for it because even if you look at it from a traditional perspective, we women are chiefs, uh, women um, are community leaders. We have those. The, I mean, the environment is even more receptive to it than it's here in the United States. I mean, we can't even get a female on a ticket, let alone if she gets on the ticket to win. Um, you know, Donald Trump beat a highly qualified candidate of Hillary Clinton. I think that should say a lot about where um, this country is as far as female leadership. Um, another thing I wanted to note was that, you know, you know, as we look at things, I try as because of my experience to not always be insular and in how I look at, you know, the world and women's political participation. So Globally, you know, the UN this this year actually, in addition to the celebrating the hundred years of the women's suffrage movement, this was also supposed to mark the 25th year of Beijing, the was it Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, so better known as Beijing plus 25. And 25 years ago, women leaders and uh, global leaders got together to come up with this comprehensive strategy for to achieve gender parity. And you know, looking forward, you know, now looking back where we are, um, can we really say that this has been achieved? Um, I think we've made strides, but I definitely don't think that globally we have gotten to the point of um, achieving full women's empowerment. Um, it fell short. And um, while I think the UN does a great job of creating such strategies, you know, the, the, the you know, what is it? the, the sustainable development goals, all these goals, they kind of, I look at it like, like oil and water, they just kind of sit, and the, it sits on top of the water, and the water being the countries, the government, all the things that make up places do not necessarily um, build the infrastructures that need to take place to ensure that these sustainable goals are there. So they're this benchmarks for great things, which I believe, but if people and if government is not building legislation, um, then we can't achieve it. And that's why I think it's important that women participate because if, you're, if your voice is not at the table, you are included. Um, and so while this year's focus is generation equality, we also have to be practical and strategic about what it will look like to achieve this. And so um, in our subsequent questions, I'll break that down of what I think are um, things that we can start doing in Nigeria and even across the continent um, and taking some good examples from the US for what it's worth um, and um, applying that to an environment that's different, but I think could be more beneficial for women's political participation. All right, great. Um, thank you so much, Twain. That was very insightful. Um, and you did write, um, you know, the model should actually be African countries. For example, Ethiopia and Rwanda right now, you know, have the highest number of um, women across parliaments in Africa. And that's really committed. Yep. Yes, and that really just shows us like the gaps in Nigeria, because right now um, we're just about 11 House of Representative members out of um, 360, which is a huge gap. And I think when you look at, um, Nigeria in terms of gender responsive budgeting, you know, the gaps are actually filled because the key social indicators like health care and, and education are prioritized as secondary sectors in the budgets of Nigeria. When you look at the, you know, the infant and the Martin mortality rate, you look at out of school children in Africa, those numbers are alarming. But like you said, if we don't get women into office to represent us, then how can we actually get them to advocate for the right policies, to push for the right policy, and to pass them into law? So you're currently, um, you, you hold a very strategic role in American politics right now as the Director of Communications for the Congressional Black Caucus U.S. House of Representatives. And yeah, so that's really great. Um, we celebrate you for that. <laughs> um, I think my question will be, how has the rise of women into elective office and the appointed office in America really changed the narrative from, for, for, for the United States and what can Nigeria learn from, 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 this, um, from this trend here? Yeah. Okay, so um, 
yeah, my job is very, it's been quite interesting. Um, I've shifted from, I've just made a shift from international development to work directly on Capitol Hill. And it's been an eye opener in learning how politics is actually played. It is a game. And also what legislate, what it takes to change legislation. I think most of us from the other side, we, at least in the United States, legislation takes a long time. And so understanding what that looks like and you know, how we need to ensure that we're communicating with people that we are doing the work and we are hearing what you have to say, but this is a process. Um, and, and this is what it will take to achieve that. Um, but I will say this, in the United States and, um, and probably when you look across anywhere is that women didn't just say what they wanted, they took it. And when I say we took it, I don't necessarily want to say, um, you get in, as, as John Lewis would say, get, I want to get into good trouble. And so I think that you can get mad, but it's in how also we position ourselves and how we take it. And we need to be strategic about it. Oftentimes, I think there are stereotypes of what they believe that, oh, well, women, they're just going to shout and they're going to, you know, say this. I think we can be smart. And that's some of the stuff that I'll talk about of how we can organize and get ourselves together so that we can have the power. When you don't have the power, you're on the other side of the table or usually out of the room powerless. And so that's one thing that I think that we need to understand as women is that what it means to play politics. Um, and so, um, you know, I talked about the women's suffrage movement as a way to uh, increase women's political participation, but we also have to remember that our skills are needed. Uh, funny joke, when I first started working on Capitol Hill, I used to wear heels every single day. And I, I mean, I still do, but the floors were extremely hard, like cement, marble. I don't know what it was, but it's my feet would kill me. And, you know, I noticed that most chicks normally wear blocked heels or flat shoes. And they would say, you know, and I would be like, why is this floor so hard? I mean, I've worked in buildings in Nigeria. And I mean, I used to complain that the sh ground would mess my shoes up, but this was different. But apparently, you know, they would sit, and so people would say to me, well, you know, men definitely built these buildings without females in mind. And I was like, what? But it's true. The first woman in Congress wasn't there until 1916. And Cannon, which is, we have three office buildings. It was built in 1908. Those buildings were built for men. There was no woman, nobody was thinking about, does a woman need a baby changing station? Does a woman need uh, to the bathroom to be in this location? There was no inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. And so I think that having women, and, and we're suffering for it today. That's why we can't walk far in those buildings uh, because the floors are extremely hard and they're far apart. They're not designed for women. Mm -hmm. And so we need to realize that even something as basic as that, women and men, we are not the same. And we bring different things to the table. When legislation and budgets are being made and there is no female voice, to, and not only to speak about health, I mean, uh, to only speak about women's issues, there's no one to bring a different perspective or bring a, a, a a female perspective to a national issue such as national security, conflict <laughs> resolution, Boko Haram, uh, water issues, uh, women in technology. There's no one else, or just even the technology sector. There are there's no um, diversity, and government cannot move forward without inclusiveness. And that means inclusiveness, even in terms of women. What do the women look like? From youth, younger women to older women. So women from the Southeast, women to the, from the Northeast and from the Southwest. I think that when you don't have those voices at the table, legislation is passed and no additional insight is made. And so that's why it's really important that we understand that our skills are, are needed, even down to the bare basic. Um, and so, you know, it's not just uh, education. I also see that women, if they do get into politics in Nigeria, they're just dumped into women affairs. No, women need to be in, need to also be, I think, uh, in the financial services. In, uh, when uh, the commissioner, or was she a minister at that time, Kemi Adelshu, you know, she was practically ran out of office. And for the, for the issue that was claimed for why she was to be, she needed to step down, you guys wanna tell me that male leaders in that country have not done worse? But for what it's worth, she's brilliant. And she was trying to implement certain things. I'm not a political, I'm not a, you know, APC, PDP, or any political party yet because I believe that parties don't have ideologies behind them. Um, but it, it's interesting to see how our women in political positions or institutions that are government institutions when they are there, how they are able to, um, the kind of bar that they are set to. 
And sadly, we cannot erase that. And so therefore, we have to be almost 10 times more prepared and more ready. And that's one of the things I'll talk about in, my, in one of my um, questions and your questions later about how do we level ourselves up? Because the bar is not coming down for us. We can say this, this and that, the bar is not coming down for us. So this is how we need to prepare. Um, I think it's important that we understand that there's power in collective movements. When I look at females in Nigeria, I, Opia Zekwaseli, for example, I think they, I felt like they lacked the structure of female support behind them. And it was disappointing. Um, there, there are no, there are very few organized bodies of support with power. You have to understand that power is required for politics, not activism. There's a difference between being an activist and being a politician. And so when you don't have the power behind you and you have not created the power behind you, we cannot move forward. Um, and we cannot continue to play the game by their rules and standards. Shirley Chisholm, again, she was the first black woman in Congress and she was also one of the founders of my caucus, which was in 1971, that wasn't that long ago. Um, and so the success was on the backs of women when she, her success was on the backs of women when she got into office. She talked about um, how she organized when, in her party in New York, how she organized the wives because the wives of the political leaders were responsible for um, fundraising. So there was this annual fundraiser that they do and they, they were responsible for selling the tickets, but they never got any of the money. So they would have, you know, budget, you know, they want to do programs, but they have no money, but yet they raise 100% of the funds for the men's political events. And so guess what? She organized with them and made them demand that they would no longer raise this money if they're not given a percentage of it to also do their own events. And so again, that's about collective movements and having that power. I felt like a woman like Opia Sekwaseli did not have that behind her. And therefore she had to conform to the rules of the party, the power and parties that be ahead of her and probably a lot more other women. Um, and so I think that's, knowing that is what kind of changed the game for um, women in Nigeria, I mean, women in the United States. And lastly, you know, when you get into, when we do have women in politics, we have to understand that we need to empower other women. We need to hire ourselves in certain roles and not to be your admin or bag carrier. Um, we can't just talk the talk. We need to be able to treat other women that work for us good. That is really important. We cannot treat our female staff horribly and expect them to not work, you know, not want to support. Um, I think that if anyone's seriously interested in politics, you should try get a copy of her book. It's called Unbought. Yeah, and thank you. And I can put that in the chat, but it's called Unbought and Unboss. It's a good short read about being bold and um, just what it takes to be a woman in that space. Um, and like I said, I think that Africa is ripe for political participation and with the right steps, um, you know, I think we can achieve it. Thank you so much, Tony. I mean, that was so insightful. One thing that really stood me, that really stood out for me was you saying that, you know, um, women have always been at the forefront of mobilizing for men, fundraising for men, but where has that gotten us to? And that's the same manifestation in Nigerian politics today. I mean, half of, more than half of the voter population or most of the voter population in Nigeria are women. Women. women wasn't for it's men. Always women. The problem. I mean, there has to be something wrong. We need to fix us to get us into politics and into power. So, I mean, that's something that we're definitely going to hold on to. And I hope everyone, you know, goes, you know, goes forward with that conversation and engage your network about the importance of supporting women. As Toyin said, do not employ women as just your admin or your back carriers. You need to treat them well for them to stay loyal to you and for them to stay dedicated to the business. So, um, we're running against time, so I'm going to go straight to the next question. And in, in just about two, three minutes, you know, just um, try and share some insight into this. And, you know, it's um, research shows that most ladies in the private sector are not really interested in politics and hardly ever run for office. As someone who has won both caps in the private sector and development in public sector, what is your message for women in this category on why they should care enough to run for office? I think that, I don't necessarily think that women don't want to. 
I think that globally, and especially in Nigeria, we have not addressed the barriers to women's political participation. And one of the biggest barriers to women's political participation is violence against women. And until violence and against women is, is truly addressed, and not addressed from the side of ribbon cutting, we are, you know, we did some event, but true um, legislative reform to protect the women who go on the front lines from physical violence, physical violence from being punched, hair pulled, uh, being killed, beaten, and so forth. You know, those are things that would make you discouraged to participate in politics. And they're very valuable, uh, valid reasons. When I first, um, when I first joined when i came for a job in nigeria i remember someone having i remember having to go to a team meeting or whatever and we and the meeting was like at 10 p.m at night you know these are not ideal situations for a female talk less of a female if you were young or a female with a husband and so when the political space is you you must conform to how they're doing politics it it, it discriminates women indirectly whether we we say it or not and so i think that without legislation that protects women um on the front lines uh, i think recently in one of the elections there was a lady who a politician in one of these states who was who was attacked or something and it was it went viral and i was like these are the instances that we've seen in um in my previous role you know one of their campaigns was called not the cost which was basically saying violence is not the cost of a woman's political participation and we had testimonials from women who some one lady she's from um uh togo she doesn't even live there anymore because her family has been threatened she has a child now but she can't speak up and want to do things in togo anymore because of violence another lady uh from i think guatemala talked about how she was punched in her face and so if there's not a legislation to protect women um but then also for us women understanding they these are the risks of the game and when these are the risks, what are the mitigating factors we want to put in place? Do you have to travel with only with five people? Do you need to make sure that your emails are, you, you change your password of your emails every three months or every two weeks? Uh, who is your backup? And you know, who has your backup number? Who must always know where you are? We cannot, um, in addition to while we wait for legislation, we cannot be unaware of the risk factors and we must prepare our women who want to go into politics to understand what is at the table and make sure that they can um, you know put the, the things in place to mitigate these risks um, so I think for me that is um, one of the main reasons why women are just shied away from getting involved I've had uh, females who I've known who've worked in the Nigerian sector who don't who've left and said you know what Biko, I'm going to go and do my uh, small business. You know, I'm going to open my salon or something else along those lines. I want to open my restaurant because nobody wants that. And so I think that there are all, and then also there are other roles that women can play. I'm just the director of communications, but I do play my little bit of my part. But there, and on Capitol Hill, there are female legislative directors. There are female chiefs of staff. There are female technical advisors female senior advisors, we need to make sure that women get into these roles as well, because you can't just jump into politics. I mean, even some of our, the politicians that we've seen, when I look at their history and their background, they were either working at the state level before, or they were um, somebody's chief of staff, or they were a legislative director. So this experience is really crucial. I think that sometimes in Nigeria, we just want to jump to the top, like you want to run for president, like, eh, you know, like, let's, start working in the government first you know so that's my uh, feedback on that okay perfect thank you so much Tony. so i just need to mention that um zoom has been so kind enough to leave the 40 minutes so that allows for a bit of more extensive conversation because i'm going to oh, okay. comments now for i can see people smiling yay so we're having a good conversation so let me go to the comments now um before i go to the last two questions for you um Tawin. Okay, so let me start with this question for um, Bemi Sola. Bemi Sola says, in your experience with US politics, how would you advise women starting up their political careers with the current political structure in Nigeria? Would you advise joining any of the existing major two to become visible or join the new generation ones which presents little or no chance of getting you the seat? So I think one, uh, the, one of the things that I mentioned previously is that it's not always just the seat. I think 
the big parties will remain there. Um, but I have not been a fan because I, I feel like they don't have an ideology behind them. Um, it's kind of jump here, jump there. But what might be interesting is that these newer parties or these smaller parties um, being able to go in there and help provide some structure. Like I said, legislation and movements are not overnight. So if you are learning things that you see like, okay, what's gonna be our ideology in this policy? I mean, in this party, um, what is it? Are we going who gets the ticket? Will there be primaries? Ensuring that there's election, um, that there's transparency in, in your party's elections. All of those things will take time to making sure that, you know, this party grows to what it is. Because again, I don't think that those two parties in Nigeria are, I don't think they're as strong of parties as a uh, Democrat slash Republican. I mean, we are barely struggling to get a third party in, which is, I mean, as you can see, Bernie Sanders Independent Party. So I think with Nigeria, because people have moved from party to party to party, the, the tomorrow now or the next three or five years, APC could be dead you know, be just because somebody moved back. Um, PDP might outlive, you know, APC. So getting some experience in some of these smaller parties, I think will be very helpful. And then getting into the process because you need to see what it is that they do. You need to see how the money is shared. You need to see how, you know, this stuff, uh, budgets are made or not made and then begin to work from there to build a brand for yourself as a political leader. So that when you are ready, to take on a big position, you have a platform, you have a collective audience behind you who knows and who has seen what you've done. Okay, thank you so much, Tony. Let me just read some comments so they don't get lost in the... So um, someone says, um, the main challenge for women... So Adebola Adeoye says, the main challenge for women in politics and business in Nigeria is a lack of power. Olukemi Ari says, Totally agree with advocacy in the form of network groups, also important to diversify allies. Um, Tajuddin says, I think it's high time women started talking to men as allies rather than running the women movement from the angle of women only. Um, I agree. Yes, I agree with that to men as allies. We need to understand, you know, the intricacies and we need to, like you said, politics is a game. We need to come to play the game. Um, I believe we have a lot, a whole lot of women across Nigeria that can do much better than what we are offered because I believe getting supported from women is so much strength for a woman. Now, from now for women talking down on women, how can we address this? Okay. It's not even, it, it, it's an, you lead by example. You lead by example. I also think that in the just general political space at times in Nigeria, people forget that like you're supposed to be serving your constituents. Because the power is not back on the people to hold accountability to the people that you voted for. You know, so if in as much as, you know, my environment is tough and, you know, there are some tough things that I or others might feel like, you know, members can be very strong. I'm like, man, I worked in Nigeria, can nothing pass this was so it's okay if you tell me wait one moment, that's nothing. In Nigeria, they'll tell you to shut up and get back. So we have to understand that we are serving our constituents, first and foremost. You know, I think that these I've not seen any member of Congress, you know, um, forget that because as you got there, you can get voted out. And you don't always, you're not guaranteed that two or four year seat that you have. So you're very mindful. We're seeing that a little different from this current man, but that's a different story. But in general, um, understanding who you work for. I think politicians in Nigeria think that uh, we work for them and they don't understand that they work for us. You work for your citizens. You are a public servant. You're not there to chop money. You're a public servant. You're there to work. You're there to make the country better. So I think leading by example and um, to change that mindset. So even in the role that you're in, it depends on how you um, serve your community. And that includes serving your staff who work for you. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, that's, 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 that's really important. Thank you for that. Um, you, there's something that you, you just said now that really stood out that, you know, if you get elected into office, you know, you can be voted out. And that makes you feel, so that makes you accountable to people. And you can agree with me that the lack of accountability, uh, accountability in Nigeria can be attributed to the lack of the rule of law. Yeah. We have 
policies on paper, we have some laws that have been passed, but the lack of implementation of those laws, the fact that the politicians said that, you know, we actually answer to them, but you know, answer to us. So, you know, how do we address this? How do we start prioritizing the rule of law? What can we do as everyday Nigerians to really make this work for us? Well, I think one of the things that I learned or I came to see that was different here in the United States is the power of, of lobbying. Um, and we may be doing it quite informally in Nigeria, but we can formalize that process because when enough people, you have, you have uh, citizen engagement, so that is getting the community involved. I can guarantee you if enough people don't show up for a rally or enough people show up for a rally and they hold people accountable and they have support, what happens is there's always one person's voice, voice in Nigeria and everybody will leave them alone. I've seen things happen here where like a community leader takes the helm of things and the community follows behind, be it with petitions, be it with certain things. And I understand that things are harder in Nigeria, trust me. But we have to formalize what lobbying looks like. We have to formalize what that looks like. It's not an informal thing. Letters, visits, I mean, our buildings are open. You know, our buildings are open. Anybody can come in at any time. You cannot say you can you you don't you can come into your member's office. Now, if you see the person, that's a different story, but you can come to your member's office. So I think that pushing accountability and open government is really important in Nigeria right now. So even just have some of these uh, things begin to move forward, but it's about power uh, and, and, and ensuring that we have power. And one of the big things that are required for power is money. And I'll talk about money, um, uh, and I think I had addressed that in your next one of my next uh, responses. But for money, um, and so those are things that'll help make changes because uh, money talks. Okay, perfect. I, I mean, I really love that um, because it, you know it's. I love so one thing I love about your, this conversation with you, Tony, is that it's so realistic and it's so relatable, and that's because you sort of had like an intersection of the best of both worlds. Um, for some reason, a lot of Nigerian women shy from the money talk when it comes to politics. And, and that's why for us at Electa, you know, we are trying to raise a $10 million fund to support 1,000 women Now, that's just what we can do on our part, because you understand that without money, you cannot sit at a table. Without money, you can, you know, get, you can mobilize a team that will support you when you're running. And the money is <laughs> But you need money to run. Um, so I'm going to go to the last question, and then we'll dive into the last set of last set of comments and questions from um, the, the 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 audience. So, what are your three top recommendations for increasing women's political participation and representation in Nigeria? Simply, how do we level up? Okay. So I think that um, I'd recommend one addressing the barriers, um, and I talked about the violence against women. This is a main, this is a, one of the reasons, um, and that's twofold. So in addition to the legislative part, um, you know, knowing the law, what has Nigeria done about uh, violence against women? Um, is there any legislation out there? Um, and if not, uh, lobbying for that. But in addition to that, protecting the women on the front lines. So what is that going to take and what is that going to look like? I don't think it's enough to just um, say, hey, we're getting beaten. If we're getting beaten, we need to go. If we're campaigning, then she needs to campaign with X, Y, and Z amount of people always there. Um, lack of so another barrier is the lack of access to funds. Women need money to run for office. Um, if our money is involved, we can do a lot. Um, I watched this uh, Madam C.J. Walker movie on Netflix. And while it's not completely accurate, one thing was very sure. I remember when she just wanted, Madam C.J. Walker just wanted to, you know, talk to uh, uh, Booker T. Washington because he had a room full of investors. And, but she had the relationship, she started building a relationship with the wives. And at that time, the wives were never in those kinds of meetings, but yet the wives were all, they were extremely educated. And I kept saying to myself, why don't she just ask the women for the money? But she was she was so focused on, you know, speaking in front of the men, speaking in front of the men. And but these women, you know, they stay in the back in the kitchen. And so finally, when she was able to make her presentation by just storming in the room and Booker T. Washington saying he would never get her the money, the wives got together and they put an envelope of money together. We cannot discredit 
what our little bits can do, you know, in these moments, because now you have the power. Um, and then another thing that is a barrier is training. I think women need to be trained to go from activists to politicians. Um, these are not the same roles. And so you might be good at mobilizing and we're, we're really good at mobilizing. We're really good at, you know, campaigning, wearing the Ankara, you know, selling the uh, materials, getting the market women involved, but we do not understand politics. And that, and unfortunately, because the, the rules were written by men, we have to learn those rules because you cannot move forward if you don't actually know what it is that you're trying to do. You have to learn the rules. You have to learn how they get the money. You have to learn how they pass things in the house uh, or house of representatives. You have to learn. You have to know who the godfathers are besides the Tinubus. You have to know who the, what the, who the power brokers are and who the power dealers are to understand how you're going to change things. I think oftentimes as women, we, we kind of go into these things blindly and we go into it with our heart. And when we go into it with our heart and with all this hard work, we're not gonna get acknowledged for that. Um, and so those are three, those are, so I think I broke this down, yeah. So that was my first response is addressing the barriers. And now once you've addressed the barriers, I think some solutions that we can do is to mobilize and mobilize in lobbying. Um, so collectively lobby the government, be organized about it. So what is that going to look like? Does that look like writing letters every week? Does that look like partnering with organizations like the National Democratic Institute, plugging into what they're doing? Does that mean, you know, plugging into um, other people, um, going to events that any person from the House of Rep is speaking at? What does that look like? It shouldn't be ad hoc. Um, and then also understanding what the traditional laws are around the usage of our names as women and the ability to participate. Because these laws still exist in Nigeria and we don't, we're not aware fully of them. And they'll tell you, eh, from our village, you can't do this, or your name, you can't change, you, you know, just all sorts of stuff, these traditional rules that are there. So I think we need to be, we need to have those like, like uh, FAQs or some sort of knowledge bank where women can know the law of the country um, at both levels. And then um, uh, creating a political action committee. So in the US, we call them PACs. Basically, they are registered organizations that pool and raise money for political candidates. Um, in, um, in the States, one of the most popular ones for women is called Emily's List. I don't know if you've heard of Emily, but you've probably heard of Emily's List. But making an Emily's List of Nigeria and find the candidates that you're going to stand behind. What ideology platform that they're in. They can be in any political party. It doesn't matter because you're going to be the one, y'all are going to put the money on the table for them. You're going to raise, you're going to do the same. You're going to prep this candidate. You're going to get this candidate on TV. You're going to get this, you know, the, the, the pack that they have. We're having a bit of some challenge with your audio. It's the person that's lit up right now. Okay, can you all okay, hear me? I think a, um, a pack should have multiple facets to it. So one side of it could be your fundraising side. So whoever is responsible for market women in Lagos Island, whoever is responsible for, you know, uh, women in the uh, market, whoever is responsible for the high society club, raise money. This is our candidate. These are our candidates in this area and this area. And what is your candidate going to do for you? Again, we go into it sometimes as activists. If you're raising money, you need to let people know what it is that you're bringing to the table for them. It's quid pro quo in this kind of in, in political environment. It is quid pro quo. So if your men understand this very well, we need to get this um, in our head that if you're gonna raise some money, what will appeal to market women? What will appeal to the high society women? So they will drop the checks for you because women have the money. So I think having, I don't know what it would be called or how it would be registered in Nigeria in terms of business, but a political action committee that gets behind female candidates and also trains the female candidates um, on, and so that was the last part is creating institutes for learning to address the key things every politician needs to understand. We need to get our women ready to level up, change the mindsets, and politics is not for chopping money. We must serve our constituents who ele elected us into these positions. So that means know the law, 
our women po politicians need to know the law. They need to know how to communicate. They need to know how to campaign. Those are key components to effective women's political participation. I think if we can start um, getting our women shaped up like this, they become more viable candidates and they have the block behind them, which is the power to have those conversations and to get those slots on TV. Because I'm telling you, if you are a good candidate and you have money because media is pretty much paid for in Nigeria, there's nothing you can't have. There's nothing you cannot have, but you have to have the money. And we have to understand that those are the barriers to women. So if we want women to participate, we need to also at the same time identify these well, what these barriers are, and then work towards eliminating them. Well, Tony, thank you so much for, I mean, for that robust insight. So we need to address the barriers. That's very key. And I mean, that's one area of work that we are, you know, um, definitely um, working on in the lecture. But just to, um, just to shed further light on, you know, we, we talked about um, political action committees and the PACs. And that exactly, that's exactly Electa's model. So um, at the moment, you know, we, we launched last year and we have a 4 e model, which is, a, which is essentially engage, encourage, equip, and engage. And the engage phase is what we're doing now, engaging all stakeholders, men as allies, grassroots, the, you know, the, the earliest community, the, the, just everyone involved, every stakeholder, every citizen, every organized group, every non-organized group to ensure that we understand the implications but also the encouraged part is finding a way of, you know, to support women, to kind of convince them to run for office. Because right now, if they're implementing the fight, could you, could you mute your call, please? If they, if they implement the 5% quota in Nigeria, are we going to have enough women to run for office? So under the encourage for Electa, what we want to try to do is either try an incubator through online, online um, classes, you know, we want to ensure that we encourage women. And the equip part is you talked about, you know, also um, having some sort of capacity building. So into, inside our model, you, you find Electoral Academy. And essentially, it's to upscale the knowledge of those female candidates. We need to come to the table ready. Intentionality is very key here. They need to understand the political system. They need to understand, you know, the, the legislative system. They need to understand the judiciary. They need to understand how to run a campaign, mobilizing, fundraising, every single thing they need to do. And we're going to do that online and offline. So with the online, you know, we get different people to talk to people about how to run for office and different crucial um, topics. And through the incubation program, we work with this woman over a period of months to get them ready for office. And so they will be our frontliners. And on that, they engage. We started building our, our, our volunteer community. And essentially is we need skills. This women need people that can offer the skills, you know, when they want to run for office. But also part of it election campaign fund so election campaign fund like you said is raising money either from crowdfunding from different organized group from the from the international development community through different um creative and innovative means and the idea is to get behind capable female politicians because if we need to change something we cannot keep doing business as usual. There's a whole lot at stake here. So as you said, you know, we're trying to also learn some things from the likes of Emily's list, Vote Run League, She Should Run, the PSs in America who are really, who, who, who have had some sort of track record and have, have been very instrumental into getting women into key offices in the United States of America. So um, we definitely relate, really relate with that. And we're hoping that, you know, um, the journey to 2023 will have a whole lot more PAC after the show up to support women and continue to be intentional about the, the kind of solutions that prefer to the, um, the support as well or to the movement as well. So I'm going to open up because, um, I mean, Tonya has been so gracious to, we, we've stolen uh, some part of his heart to do from you. So I'm going to open to um, some know, right? questions. <laughs> Thank you. Some more comments and questions. And this time around, um, we can actually allow you to speak, so you can unmute and ask your question or your comments, but let's make it very, um, very brief, very concise, so that we can give um, other people the opportunity and the chance to engage as well. So guys, please feel free to speak or drop your comments in the chat below and we'll read them or we'll listen to you in the next five minutes, five, ten minutes so that we can wrap up.
Okay, so someone just said, please, Tony's social media handle. I am going to type that. It is so on Instagram, it is Miss. And then you can follow. I remember when I, I, know, I mean, um, Twitter, Twin. I am. I just need to find it. Um, <laughs> I am. And I actually use it. I do use it. I do use it a lot. Um, hold on. I'll, I'll send it to the group. Okay, good. Okay, awesome. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, everyone. So there's a comment from Bemi Sola Osado again. She says, true, we shouldn't undermine the power of support of women like us. In my presidential elections in my university, in my uni student union in 2012, my first campaign fund was contributed by a group of young women just because I shared the aspiration with them at a mentoring meeting. That act alone strengthened and I knew there was no going back. So guys, that's something. Um, So Chilima says, what do you think of having political sponsors in getting women in office or grooming women into, con in, into, into governance? I think you've spoken a lot about that, but I don't know if you have one or two things to add about um, to that, Toyin. Um, I mean, you, sponsors can come in different ways. I mean, sponsor is an endorser, someone who endorses you. I know we don't use that language very much, but uh, we, we can use that. And at the end of the day, anyone who is endorsing, all these people that come behind that are endorsing, they're, they're also going to be indirectly campaigning for this particular c candidate. That's what that means. They're not just saying I'm endorsing for the sake of saying I'm endorsing. So, you know, yeah, I, I, in the game of politics, yeah, you need that. You do need that. Hmm. Okay, so Bukola Agola says, thanks, Tony. You spoke about, about the book earlier. What's the book, please? Um, Abbasade, I shared that, you know, in the chat session. So you can just find that by scrolling back to a comment. Um, and then you'll find that. So um, anyone's got um, comments, suggestions, recommendations, questions, please feel free to speak now. So Elijah, you sent me a message on Facebook. I will probably never... Um check that so i can give you all my email and you can find me on linkedin i'll likely respond there but uh, my email is just my first name tony.awesu at gmail.com but linkedin i mean facebook i just go in and exit i don't even read anything so yeah. and please when we send our emails let's let's restrict it to professional conversations and not personal conversations please that's very important as well because we need to respect um privacy um, so um, Abosade has um, responded. So Buki, you can find the title of the book there. Um, any other questions, any comments, anyone? Abosade, comments from you? No, I mean, I, I guess I'm just so grateful to um, Toyin for her insight. I mean, I definitely agree with you that she brings very interesting perspective based on obviously the intersection of her experiences and as you kind of summarized in the end kind of validates our model and theory of change in elector around sort of the four e's and the fact that we really really um did a lot in terms of understanding what the barriers are and then definitely sort of uh, designing elect her to address those barriers so i think for me it's very validating to see that you know the thought process was right and we definitely have the right model so it's really around how we implement that you know um so thank you again Toyin. really yeah, really great you're welcome and it's really important like i think even in the US, it's time for us to even consider legislative reform. And so in Nigeria, there's definitely the aspect of electoral reform because our elections are horrendous. Um, there are too many political parties on a ticket and that's why it takes days to count uh, votes. Um, so electoral reform is important. Um, and so is legislative reform. Um, although I don't think that passing laws is as difficult in, the, in Nigeria, America is extremely complicated and very slow. Um, but 
you won't know unless you know you all have built that knowledge bank of you know information of just how in the world does anything get passed in Nigeria. I think by understanding that, then you you empower women to um, and empower women in politics to go after those right steps. Because like I said, we're off. We're great activists. Uh, we're great at you know indirectly raising money. Uh, but we go into politics and what that looks like with those same mindsets and that's not it and we get crushed every single time so i think understanding that and knowing the law will be very helpful perfect okay so let me read um the last two questions and then we'll round up um so from augustine she says what is the role of men what is the role of men in what is the role of men in women politics and how can female political aspirants help involve them well, they're necessary because they're the majority. So you can't ex we can't exclude them, but there are allies and there will be allies. And so identifying who those allies will be. And again, it's what do we have to bring to the table and not our bodies. And so being able to know that we, again, it's quid pro quo in this. And so you have to be able, we have to have our women be able to bring something and us finding those allies for us and whoever those allies are working with them. So even in the form of being endorsers behind a candidate, you know, so if a musician endorsed you or a strong politician endorsed a female candidate, it means something. Um, again, it doesn't necessarily have to be at this high level, but who else will be behind, you know, Obi? Who, who from your school? Okay, let's break it down. For some of the people that are, you know, talking about positions that they're holding in their university, who are the, you know, uh, what do we say, the influencers on your campus that can endorse you, females and males? You need those voices as well. Um, so, um, Elijah, you raised your hands. Do you want to say something? You, sorry? Okay, yeah. that make it very concise. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on this platform. I really appreciate uh, the speaker. Well, I just wanted to say something. I really have a question to ask. My concern particularly is towards the younger generation. So I, I think if we want to in increase or if we want to enhance the inclusion of women in leadership and decision making in Nigeria, we have to see how to work on strategy programs that can influence the activities of young girls, especially those in the university. They have to understand that Nigeria is their problem or that Nigeria is their interest. And then whatever happens, because several times I've interacted with young ladies, many young ladies, we just have few of them that are intellectually minded. Most times they are carried away by social, um, it could be, it could be it could be as trivial as, as, as a social program or something. They are not really interested in politicking and, and, um, and uh, the, the, the learning of decision making and all this. So we can organize programs that can make them to learn about policy making, policy influencing, um, how to make this um, influence decisions in their local environment. It could just be involving in social activities in their local environment. They have to start from somewhere. There must be a CD. You can just aspire to be a president and you don't even know how to um, mobilize your committee to, towards maybe achieving a social, um, uh, something like that. So we have to work towards that. I think our focus should be how to help these young ones come up. Thank That's you. a great point. And it's interesting because I'm wearing this t-shirt. Um, I thought it would get seen on the screen, but not. But it basically says who runs the world. And it's got this crown on it over here. And it says girls. So we had these t-shirts made for us when we went to um, Vancouver for Women Deliver. Um, and we had one of our programs that was focused on youth and when we say youth, not 35 year olds is what Nigeria uses youth for, but I'm talking about 13, 14 year olds, engaging those people on, you can be a leader. And so we have these t-shirts that people wore that said, you know, who run the world girls, because we understand that political um, leadership also starts at a young age. And what does that mean? Like being a class captain, being, you know, um, you know, your school prefect or something like that. And making sure that we also support women, support these young girls and encourage them because they're going to get a lot of flack from, it could be their fathers, it could be their mothers who are scared of what could happen to them. And it can even be their other friends, but finding those, you know, those unicorns and those people who want to be leaders and teaching them to be leaders, you know, even in their classrooms, being leaders in a student body president, all of those things is very, very important because that's how we're gonna change a generation. 
Thank you so much. Um, Augustine, you have a comment? Hello, Augustine, do you have a comment? Okay, so we'll just let that go. I'm going to read the last, um, oh, so Vemi Fela say, hey, I was in Vancouver as a women deliver young leader. Oh, okay. yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. It was, it was a bit much. It was a long week, but. Yeah. Question is um, for Alexa. Um, Fabia says, the question is for Alexa. How are you collaborating with other, sorry. How are you collaborating with other women's networks such as the Nigerian Women's Trans, Trust Fund so that you have a critical mass in your engagement? Thank you very much, um, um, Fabia. That's definitely um, in the works and it's part of our strategy to also um, to partner with um, other um, mobilizing networks, other coalition groups like the Nigerian Women Trust Fund. So, um, that's definitely, you know, like I said, to increase the critical mass and to ensure that we have the right volume of ladies and the quality of women that we want. Okay. Um, I think we're going to wrap up because we're about one hour. Um, so any last comments from you, um, Toyin? Um, I hope that, you know, I was able to share some, you know, valuable information, but just understanding most importantly that um, politics is, is a game. And so we have to make sure that our women are ready and prepared on all fronts. And money and fundraising is very big. However we decide to write those rules for ourselves is our decision. But we need to acknowledge it very early on and how are we going to mitigate that and as well as the risks as well. But I think that Africa, um, Nigeria is very ripe for political, women's political participation. It's just about how we go about doing it. Thank you so much, Tony. All right, guys. Um, I'd like to say um, thank you guys so much for a very um, engaging session. would like to say a very big, massive, gigantic uh, thank you to Tony for your time, for the insight. It's been a really um, engaging conversation. I would definitely look forward to tapping into this existing knowledge, um, you know, at Electa. Um, would like to say thank you to each and every one of you for sharing the Saturday with us. We will keep the conversation going. Tweet about it, share on social media group. Like you said, like Toyin said, it's important we get the message out there. Let us share the message with our networks, with our community. Let them know what is at stake. Let them understand the conversations. Women's police, like I, when when Toyin started, she said something. Women's right is human is is, is human rights. It's not about women at all it's just it's about every single person it's about men boys girls women each and every one of us and if we want to change the existing outcomes we need to do things differently and for us to get women in power we need to address the barriers we need to mobilize we need to fundraise and we need to be intentional about getting women into office so thank you again everyone for joining you can follow our social media pages electa underscore ng on instagram and twitter um show your pictures from the session tweet about this and um this is going to be a monthly session where we bring a guest um you know each month to talk about different um issues um surrounding women's political participation and we hope you join us in you know each engagement so thank you again um and this is the end of our conversation thank you so much toyin thank you thank so much we're showing you so much love in the comment session so Thanks. Hey, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm going to just, I'm going to head over to my couch now, you know, uh, so, since I'm going nowhere for, for a while. But um, feel free to reach out to me um, if you have any specific questions about anything. Um, just let me know and uh, stay safe. Stay safe out there, guys. Social distancing is key. Okay, guys. Mm -hmm. Have a lovely Saturday afternoon and Saturday morning for you, Toyin. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Dr. K. Thank you very much, Toyin. Bye, everyone. Bye. Everyone. Bye. Bye.